Aum. Nitya Shuddha Vimuktai Kama Kandhananda Madvayam Satyam Jnana Manantang Yat Param Brahma Havenatat Nitya Eternal Shuddha Pure Vimukta Completely Free Ekam One Akandha Anandam Indivisible Bliss Advayam Non-dual Satyam Truth Changeless in the three periods of time Jnanam Realized knowledge Anantang Infinite Yat Parang Brahma That Supreme Brahman Ahameva I alone am, tut, that. I am verily that supreme Brahman alone, eternal, completely pure and free, unary, indivisible and non-dual, and of the nature of changeless knowledge infinity. Namaste. So this verse concludes the Bhuta Shuddhi meditation. I think it would be a good idea to go back and read the whole thing so that we have it all in context. Atman is different from the body, and so I am free from changes such as birth, wrinkling, senility, death, etc., I have nothing to do with the sense objects, such as sound and taste, for Atman is without sense organs. I am free from sorrow, attachment, malice, and fear, for I am other than the mind. He is without breath and without mind, pure, higher than the high, and imperishable. I am without attributes and action, eternal, without desire and thought, free from impurity, changeless, formless, ever liberated and pure. I fill all things inside and out like space, changeless and the same in all. I am self-realized, unattached, stainless and unmoving. I am verily that supreme Brahman alone, eternal, completely pure and free, unary, indivisible, and non-dual, and of the nature of changeless knowledge infinity. So that pretty well nails it, doesn't it? <laughs> and of course, the short version is, I am Brahman, Aham Brahmasmi. This is the version of the Upanishads. Now, most of the religions in the world are dualistic, and there's a good reason why they're dualistic. Because back in the days when these religions were developed, the world was in a phase of agrarian culture. There was no technocracy, no internet, computers, and all that. So there was not any scope, really, for the average person to develop intellectually. That was reserved for a small elite, the best of the best. And these scholars were hereditarily trained, cultured, cultivated to have extraordinary memories. There's a story I like to tell about a murder that took place in India in 1940s. And the only witness was a Bengali man, a Brahmana, who had gone through the traditional memory training. And he had been in the next room while the murderer and his victim had a quarrel, an argument. Later on, the guy came back and killed him. So this was really the only eyewitness evidence. Everything else was circumstantial. 
So in the trial, in the courtroom, the Bengali Brahmana, who did not speak English, recounted the conversation, which was in English, completely from memory. And his testimony stood the, uh, what is that called, cross-examination and so on. And the murderer was convicted and later confessed. So this is the power of memory. And by this power of memory, the entire scriptures can be known, remembered, and understood as a single whole. Now, we don't have that kind of memory training today. And of course, the whole uh, system of Varnashram has broken down and become completely confused, where everybody is sleeping with everybody else and making babies. <laughs> This is animal life, simply based on lust. And of course, the telltale is that these relationships don't last. But back in the days when the Vedic culture was still strong, was still intact even, the Brahmanas were cultivated, bred actually, to have extraordinary memory and extraordinary mental acuity. In other words, they could think. People today really don't like to think. They're lazy. So, you know, I include myself in that. I have to really motivate myself to be able to penetrate these difficult Sanskrit scriptures and get to the bottom of it and understand what it's all about. So here we have a perfect example of a prayer, a meditation that is used to attain a certain point of view on the self. And what is that? My self is Brahman. Now, how is this different from the dualistic point of view of religion? I was getting to that. In an agrarian society, more than 90% of the people are engaged in raising food. Then you have maybe 5% of people engaged in trade and a tiny elite in governance and scholarship. So these people were mostly farmers and farmers really have no business inquiring into erudite philosophy and esoteric traditions. Because if they were to lose their point of view that the ego is everything and I am the body and so on like that, they could not work anymore. Indeed, it is seen that when a person understands a hum brahmasmi, and realizes it for himself, he has no more desire to be a big wheel in society or a big authority in spiritual life or a big government official or, or really a big anything because he knows this whole material world is false. It is Maya, anything with form, anything with duality is simply a dream and it will all pass away. So why should one strive for great accomplishments in this world? Better one should strive for full self-realization, become detached and attain enlightenment, moksha, freedom. But this is not for everyone. If everyone tried to take up this point of view, society would collapse. And there wouldn't be any way then to raise up the uh, ignorant spiritual souls into knowledge so that they can become liberated in turn. That means that the dualistic religion will always be the majority. The government knows this, and therefore it does not really encourage this a monistic philosophy, non-dual philosophy, a dueta.
In fact, it goes out of its way using the intelligence services to corrupt and degrade the teachings of Advaita through the various organizations that teach Advaita. So the teachings of Advaita that you get from institutions and organizations have all been kind of dumbed down so that they can't really lead to realization. It's only the independent teachers who don't really need to answer to anyone who can give the truth as it is in the Upanishads. So anyway, this teaching gives a method by which one can detach oneself from this dualistic, uh, really this drivel of dualistic religion, which is just to coddle the ego. Oh, you're a spirit soul. You're eternal. Huh? And the way people take this, you know, even though it's philosophically is correct, the way they take it is my ego is eternal. And so it gives them a false hope, a false sense of security and release. And it allows them to go on working like a dog in somebody else's factory or farm or whatever. And thereby the human society, the structure of human society stays intact. See, that's why even the Buddha's teaching as Buddhism has become degraded into a dualistic religion. Even the teachings of Ramana Maharshi, which are, you know, pure Advaita, in one generation became completely degraded into a false teaching that is actually dualistic and sectarian. So what can we say? These pure Advaita teachings are precious and they must be preserved so that the actually intelligent people can attain that benefit of complete freedom. Not the kind of freedom that my ego is forever, huh? because that leads to all kinds of nonsense. This is the philosophy of the people who go and start wars. Huh? My ego versus your ego. Huh? My ego is bigger than yours. <laughs> Freud would have a holiday with that one. But the actual philosophy is your ego is nothing. Your ego is inconsequential. It's just a dream. It's only a thought. And when you wake up from this dream, you realize this ego is nothing. It's simply a nice idea. Oh, wouldn't it be great if my personality lasts forever? But it doesn't. Even in this life, we see that a person's interests and activities and so on change radically from childhood to adolescence to adulthood to middle age to old age and so on. And at the time of death, the blackboard slate is wiped clean and a new chapter begins in a new body, in a new world, a new environment, and so on. Unless one is so attached to the ego that he comes back again and again and again. So to really get away from samsara, to really get liberation, one has to give up this idea of the ego and all the deities and worlds and pleasures and so on that uh, surround this idea of dualism. And so the purpose of the Bhuta Shuddhi prayer is to bring us into this state of mind. It is a meditation that can bring us to moksha. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya. <laughs>